An integer polynomial is a polynomial which has integer coefficients. For example, 1 plus x squared, or 7 minus 5x minus 9x cubed, those are integer polynomials. But you can't have any fractions like this. That's not allowed. And no square roots, no, no pi's, no e's, no irrational numbers, none of that. Integers only. So here's the problem. Does there exist an integer polynomial? Let's call it p, along with three other integers, call them a, b, and c, such that p of a equals b, p of b equals c, and p of c equals a. Okay, so it's like a, it's like a loop, like the polynomial is looping the values around and around. Yeah, a loopy polynomial. So is it possible? That is the question. Well, hang on. No, of course it's possible. Actually, it's, it's trivial. Just set a, b, and c equal to the same number, like, I don't know, zero. There, done, easy. No, okay, that's, that's stupid. New rule, the numbers have to be different. All three of them, okay? They have to be distinct integers. Yeah. Now, is that possible? Hmm. Pause the video, give this problem a try if you want. All right, well, let's assume it is possible. P of A equals B, and P of B equals C, and P of C equals A. And P itself is our polynomial. So it has the form P naught plus P1x plus P2x squared plus P3x cubed plus dot 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 plus Pnx to the n. Now here's a trick. I think it's called the divisibility theorem or something. Consider P of A minus P of B. P of A is going to be P0 plus P1A plus P2A squared plus P3A cubed plus dot 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 plus PNA to the n. And similarly, P of B is P0 plus P1B plus P2B squared plus, yeah, yeah, okay, plus PNB to the n. But now, when you subtract P of B, look, these two P0 terms, they are constants, so they're just going to cancel. And then all that's left is this giant symmetric mess of A's and B's. So why would I do this? Well, because we can take out a factor of a minus b here. Look, p1 times a minus b, plus p2 times a squared minus b squared, plus p3 times a cubed minus b cubed, plus and all the way up to pn times a to the n minus b to the n. All these terms, they can be factored with an a minus b term. Yeah, so let's do that. So a minus b is a minus b. Wow, good speech read. But then a squared minus b squared is a minus b times a plus b. And a cubed minus b cubed is a minus b times, uh, I think it's a squared plus ab plus b squared? Who cares? The rest of it, it doesn't matter. All that matters is these a minus b's. That's all we care about. Because we know every single term here has an a minus b factor. And that means the whole thing is one big multiple of a minus b. And remember, this is just p of a minus p of b. But don't forget our assumption. p of a equals b, and p of b equals c. So this is also b minus c. Which means b minus c is a multiple of a minus b. Or in other words, b minus c divided by a minus b is an integer. Hmm, okay then. Now let's do the same thing over again for p of b minus p of c. Sounds like effort, but not really, because this problem is completely symmetric in a, b, and c right? We can swap them around, and it makes no difference. So we know the same thing will happen. Okay, p of b is p0 plus p1b plus p2b squared plus p3b cubed plus dot 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 plus pnb to the n. And p of c is p0 plus p1c plus p2c squared plus p3c cubed plus dot 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 plus pnc to the n. Okay, now cancel those p0 terms, and we get a nice b minus c term that factors out. So p of b minus p of c is a multiple of b minus c. But remember, p of b minus p of c, that's also c minus a. So c minus a is a multiple of b minus c. Or in other words, c minus a divided by b minus c is an integer as well. Nice, now we've got two integers. First we did p of a minus p of b and got this integer, and then we just did p of b minus p of c and got this one. And now we have to do it one more time for p of c minus p of a. And I'm just going to rush through it since it's exactly the same thing, no one cares, and you can probably even guess what we get. Yep, who knew? It's a minus b divided by c minus a. Three fractions, three integers. Hmm. But it's not pretty. Let's make it pretty. I'm going to call a minus b x, and c minus a will be y, and b minus c will be z. 
I'm just renaming everything. Because now we have x over y, y over z, and z over x. And these are our three, our three fractions. But they're not fractions, they're integers. They're integers disguised as fractions. Okay, so, so now what? Well, we need to find x, y, and z. So, I don't know, let's, let's just plug in some values and see what happens. Well, obviously we could just set x equal to y equal to z. And then these would, equal, these would all equal 1. And yeah, well, that was easy. Except there's a small problem. It doesn't work. Turns out it's very easy to prove that if x, y, and z are equal, then a, b, and c must also be equal. But distinct integers! a equals b equals c? No, that's against the rules. No good. Do it again. Okay, so, I don't know, let's try setting x equal to 4. 4 over y, y over z, and z over 4. Okay, now 4 over y needs to be an integer, which means y has to be less than or equal to 4. I mean, obviously it can't be bigger, otherwise you'll get something between 0 and 1, and no, no integers between 0 and 1. Okay, so let's just try y equals 2. Now we have 4 over 2, 2 over z, and z over 4. Okay, but now this is where we get stuck. We need to choose z such that 2 over z and z over 4 are both integers. But clearly we can't do that. We need z to be smaller, smaller than 2 and also greater than 4. This would violate all of maths and probably destroy the entire universe. So maybe, yeah, let's, let's just try again. What if we start with a really big x? Like, I don't know, 1000. Okay. Now we need to make these two into integers. Make 1000 over y an integer. Um, uh, let's see, may maybe let's try making y also a thousand. What happens then? Now we're just left with 1000 over z and z over 1000. Ah, uh, no, that that's not good. See, we already used a thousand for both x and y, so we can't do it again for z. Remember, they can't all be equal. Damn, it seems really hopeless. Ah, but it isn't. Actually, there is a solution. There's actually one and only one integer that works. We can let z equal minus a thousand. Aha, and this works. All three of them are integers now. And yeah, we did it. Except it actually doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work. I mean, it works for x, y, and z, but we're not here to solve x, y, and z. We want to find a, b, and z. That was the whole point. So we need to go back and reverse engineer them. But guess what happens when you do that? Yeah, you get a equals b equals c. Okay, I'm convinced. This problem is got to be impossible. And it is. It's impossible. You can't have a polynomial that loops around three integers like this. Okay. Oh, what's that? You want me to prove it? Oh, okay then. So let's go back to our three fractions, which are not fractions actually. They are integers in disguise. So there's something special about these three fractions. Let's multiply the first two. x over y times y over z. So the y's will cancel and it's just x over z. But notice, x over z is almost the same as our third fraction. It's just upside down. So let's take the reciprocal of both sides. And now we've got this ridiculous nested fraction equals z over x. But look closely. Remember, x over y, y over z, and z over x, they're still integers. So this equation is its actually really, really weird. Like, it's super rare. Think about it. If we just randomly picked any two integers, say like 4 and 7, the reciprocal of their product is uh, 4 times 7, so it's, it's 1 over 28, not an integer. It's not even close. Okay, try another. 2 and 6, that'll be 1 over 12. Doesn't work. In fact, for any two integers you picked, this equation will almost never work. In fact, the only time it will work is if both integers you pick are 1. That's it. Only 1, nothing else. Or actually, I guess technically they could be negative 1 as well. Okay, but fine, whatever. Plus or minus one. Those are the only solutions. So what happens is, no matter how you pick x, y, and z, these three integers must either all equal one, or one of them will be one, and the other two will be minus one. And that's actually what happened before when we set x equal to a thousand and got so, so close, but just missed it. And all you have to do now is consider both of these cases separately, then solve the three linear equations for a, b, and c, and show that in both cases, both of them, you get the exact same result, a equals b equals c. And that's it. You can't do it. See, there, there's no distinct integers. They have to all be equal. Okay, please subscribe to my channel. Bye.